So this is Philippians for Beginners. This is lesson number four. The mature Christian stands firm and imitates Christ. Philippians 1, 27 to 2, 13. Uh, in a letter to a church that Paul established during his second missionary journey, some 12 years before his Roman imprisonment, the apostle greets and blesses and prays for a group of Christians that he loves dearly because of their faithfulness and their generosity. After having given them information about his personal condition and his prospects for eventual release from prison and assurances that he would be with them soon, this is all material that we've looked at previously, Paul sets the course for their continued spiritual development. So beginning in verse 27 of chapter one, Paul will encourage them to make a continued effort to mature in Christ, and he provides them with six, six examples of Christian maturity that they can follow in their quest to grow and be more mature uh, spiritually. And so that first example um, that he gives is that the mature Christian stand, stands firm. You know, what, what does the mature Christian do? And what does the mature Christian look like? And so the first thing he says is, well, the mature Christian stands firm. Verse 27 and eight, he says, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. So Paul is coming off of his comments about those who are preaching the gospel in order to make him jealous. Remember we talked about that last time. Some were preaching out of love, some were preaching out of envy. Uh, they thought they would make him jealous. If they were preaching successfully, somehow Paul would be jealous of that because he was confined to prison and couldn't be out doing what he normally did. We looked at Paul's response to, um, to these in a, a previous verse where he states that no matter the motivation, if the gospel is preached, he says, it'll have its effect, and in this he rejoiced. You know, whether you preach the gospel with good motives or bad motives, as long as the gospel is being preached, he's happy. And the gospel, it'll bring back fruit. So he uses this sinful attitude by some as a bridge to make a first exhortation to the church concerning their conduct. Now some are acting this way in regard to the gospel, he says, you know, some are having a bad attitude if you want, but you, he says, you conduct yourselves in a different manner, okay? He says, your conduct, which should be worthy of the gospel and in line or reflective of the gospel and its message and its subject, Jesus himself, your conduct, as opposed to their conduct, which is proclaiming the message, but not doing it in the correct spirit, your conduct, should be such that whether Paul is released or not, their conduct will be the same. He thinks he'll be released and eventually be with them in person, but he's saying to them, even if he is not, he wants them to act in a mature way, okay? And not like these other guys. So this first example of spiritual maturity he describes is the ability to stand firm in the, faith, in the, faith of, uh, excuse me, in the face of opposition. And he says it's possible, you can stand firm in opposition because they all share the same spirit. They all share the same spirit, which is their spirit animated by the Holy Spirit, which each one of them have received when they were baptized, Acts 2.38. They can all stand firm because they're united in one mind. You know, we all believe the same thing as being the truth from God, which is the gospel. And so your ability to stand firm against opposition, he says, is based on the fact that you all share the same spirit, you all share the same truth, you all share the same mind about what God has taught. And thirdly, you're all working toward the same goal, and that is to maintain the teaching or the content of the gospel, 
Sometimes they, you know, they, they have an interchange, they call it the faith or the gospel. When there's an article in front of the word faith, the faith, it doesn't mean trust, it means doctrine, the faith, the body of teaching uh, of Jesus, that's the faith, okay? Uh, and so to maintain the teaching and content of the gospel against change or compromise. So they're standing firm together in one spirit, one mind and one purpose. They don't want the gospel uh, to change. So to do these things without fear, he says, is a sign of their growing maturity in Christ. They don't get excited. They don't lose their confidence just because there's some opposition, just because there are trials and, and, and tribulations. Okay. Shows their growing maturity in Christ and a reason that Paul uh, rejoices when he thinks and prays for them. When he sees them going through problems like this, and finds out that they're standing firm, they're not giving in, they're not quitting, for example, this gives him great joy. Um, in addition to this, he says, standing fear without, firm, uh, without fear of their opponents indicates two things. First of all, the destruction of their opponents. If their attackers cannot frighten them to change course or abandon their faith, it's an indication that they have lost the battle their attackers have lost the battle. Even though on the surface they may seem like a formidable enemy. And secondly, it's the confirmation of their salvation. If what they believe is true provides them with the strength to stand firm against their enemies, in other words, people and actions that they can see, then what they believe about their salvation, something they cannot see but must accept by faith, must also be true as well, since God will administer both the judgment on their enemies and their entry into heaven. So they're standing firm. They're not letting the enemies destroy them or discourage them or get them to quit. And Paul is saying, you know, when you're not quitting, when you're standing firm, it means what's inside of you is stronger than what's inside of them. They may seem bigger and more powerful, they may seem to have the upper hand, but the fact that they're not able to destroy you demonstrates that eventually they're going to lose. And it also shows that eventually you're going to win, that your faith is true and it'll be realized. And the promises that God has made to you, uh, and the ultimate promise of course is to be in heaven with Him, that's true and that will come to pass. A couple of verses, verse 29 and 30, he says, for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. So Paul adds this observation as a way to both encourage them to remain standing firm against those who are attacking them and also put into a larger spiritual context the suffering that they are experiencing as disciples of, of Jesus. The apostle explains that suffering is not in opposition to belief. Very, very important to understand. You know, as if to suffer for Christ were a failing on God's provident, providential care for His children or some kind of aberration in the Christian experience. You know, some people think, I become a Christian, I've obeyed the gospel, I'm doing what God wants, and then all of a sudden the roof falls in on me. You know, I get sick, I lose my job, I'm, I'm attacked, I'm accused of something I didn't do, and so on and so forth. What happened? You know, they think becoming a Christian means, well, no more suffering, you're good to go. And so Paul is addressing this idea that suffering as a Christian somehow is wrong or unusual or shouldn't happen. And so he says suffering, excuse me, the apostle explains that suffering is not in opposition to belief. Suffering in various ways, for example, attacks on our faith like these Philippians were experiencing, or perhaps the loss of friendship, or family conflicts because of our faith, or the emotional and physical discomfort felt as a result of res resisting temptation. It's, it's, it's hard to resist temptation. It's painful to fight the flesh, psychologically, sometimes physically. Sometimes Christians suffer actual violence against themselves because of their faith. 
So these were natural parts of the Christian experience and life. They're not exceptions to the rule, they're the rule. <laughs> so Paul summarizes this section about standing firm by stating that God is the source of all that the Philippians are experiencing, some of which is understood. For example, God is in charge of everything. God sends everything. God permits everything. And so he says to them, God has sent Christ to atone for their sins and thus made salvation possible. God did that. God has provided the faith or the teaching of salvation in the gospel. God is the one that provided that, not man. God has chosen and sent the apostles, like Paul, to bring the gospel. God is the one that sent the apostles. God has sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within them and lead them to spiritual maturity, evidenced by their firm stand against opposition and the attacks on their faith. God has done that. And finally, and this is the point he's making here, God has permitted them the privilege of experiencing suffering on account of their faith. It's not that God sends the evil, but God permits it in our lives. God doesn't send evil. God doesn't tempt us to sin, ever. But He permits us to suffer. He, 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 can, he can make it so that there's never any suffering in our life. He's God. But He chooses not to do that. So this wasn't discomfort or inconvenience or pain because of their mistake or sins. In other words, what the Philippians were suffering wasn't because of something they did wrong. And it wasn't the suffering that all human beings experience because we live in a fallen world, like you know, tornadoes and floods and accidents and disease. This wasn't suffering because mankind is sinful, you know, we're victims of crime and corruption and human uh, error. Now the suffering of the Philippians was experienced only by those who follow Christ. People who don't believe are not attacked for their disbelief. You ever noticed, have you ever noticed there are no atheist martyrs? <laughs> they don't attack people who don't believe in Jesus. You know, they don't lock them up. No, it's the believers <laughs> that are attacked. It's the believers that have opposition, not the disbelievers. So Paul says that God allows, in other words, he could have spared them, but he chose to allow believers to suffer, and here's the point, because of their faith in Christ in the same way that Christ suffered to save those who would eventually believe in him. In doing this, God grants believers the experience of both the spiritual, which is the knowledge of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. He, he sends the Spirit to give them the experience of the spiritual, as well as the human side of Christ, suffering because of His faith and His obedience to the Father. So as believers, you get to experience what Jesus experienced, the Spirit, the understanding of who God is, the joy of knowing that our sins are forgiven and that God will welcome us into the heavenly abode. You know, Jesus knew and experienced these things and we get to experience those things. But Jesus also experienced suffering, rejection. And so Paul says, he's allowed you to suffer some of the things that Jesus suffered. Rejection, difficulty, opposition, and he says, if you both stand firm as a consequence and suffer for your faith, you are experiencing the complete life of a disciple of Jesus Christ. To show that this experience is universal, Paul refers to his own suffering over a long period of time. You know when he says, the things which you saw in me and heard in me for the gospel? Well, he's referring to the things they saw and heard. They have heard about him being in prison. Some of them have visited him in prison. Many of them know of the lashes he's received and the suffering and opposition and beatings. They thought they'd killed him one time. They stoned him and they thought he was dead. So he says, you're suffering and Christ suffered, but you know what? All the believers suffer and he points to his own experience. 
to uh, confirm that idea. So the point here is that even apostles are subject to this phenomenon of belief and suffering as part of every Christian's experience. A lot of Christians, you know, they fall away because they're surprised. They're surprised that they have to suffer. They're surprised that they have doubts. They're surprised that the world sometimes puts them in a position to compromise their faith. They're surprised at that. They think that shouldn't be, but no, that, that, it, that's exactly the life of a Christian. Another indicator of maturity that Paul, as we move into chapter two, he says the mature Christian imitates Christ. So Paul leaves off his encouragement you know, to stand firm in the face of attack and adversity and suggests the kind of things necessary to help remain strong in the faith while enduring opposition. So we read chapter two, verses one to four, he says, therefore, if there are any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So those on the outside of the church are attacking and putting obstacles in the way of believers. But those on the inside of the church must also be involved in countering these attacks by providing things to help fellow believers be still and unmoved. So Paul goes from what he believes, that are, he starts from what he believes they're already doing, okay? So what they're already doing, they're giving each other encouragement in Christ. Mutual edification as Christians when they sing together and pray together. Uh, the comfort of love, their love for one another. They provide comfort and consolation to each, uh, uh, each one in the assembly. Uh, the word here is, um, the Greek word is that for encouragement. They encourage each other. Uh, fellowship of the Spirit, uh, the, the, the strength that comes from consciously sharing the Holy Spirit, the, the type of relationship that only two Spirit-filled people uh, can have. As I've said before, you can, you, can have, uh, you, can have fellowship, you can have a friendship with someone, you can be best friends with somebody, you can have you know, your best buddy and you go play golf or something, but if he's not a Christian, then you can't have fellowship. You can have friendship and all the good things that friendship brings, but you can't have fellowship. You can only have fellowship with someone who's a, a believer, okay? And so Paul says, share that. That fellowship of the Spirit is a very strong thing. It helps you to be strong. It, it, it makes you realize you're not in this by yourself. And then of course, affection and compassion. This is the actual expressed love in human interaction seen as physical affection and service and the knowledge that other Christians know and understand and share our burden. Uh, um, we have uh, every uh, service, uh, when we gather here, we have the prayer cards, the blue cards, where one of the elders will read about the needs of a particular family or individual and offer a prayer on their behalf. I I'm convinced uh, that uh, that action doesn't stop there with just the prayer. I'm sure that after that prayer is made and people find out about the needs of that individual, phone calls are made, visits are made, food is prepared, to go uh, and take care of an individual who's ill or someone who's taking care of, of another individual. This is the kind of affection and compassion that lifts our spirits and enables us to be strong in Christ and resist the opposition, resist uh, many times the discouragement that tells us, ah, oh, you ought to quit, you ought to stop believing, stop going to church. Uh, I always think uh, I get more love when I come to church than when I go to you know, work on the shop floor or go to work at the office. You know? Here people love me because of who I am, because of what I, uh, what I believe. So Paul is saying that if, as he assumes, um, uh, these things are there, then keep doing these things. And then he says, add the following, and in so doing, you'll complete his joy because they are growing in Christ. Well, add, add what, he says? Well, he says, be of the same mind so that all of you believe the same thing and preach the same gospel. 
Maintain, he says, the same mind, uh, the same mindset rather, concerning one another, which includes some things already mentioned like love and unity and having the same goals, to be faithful, to be saved. And get rid of self, uh, selfishness and pride, he says. A practical way to bring this about. How, 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 do, we get, how do we get rid of selfishness and pride? Uh, he says, well, humble your mind and your estimation of yourself and raise others above yourself so you can clearly see them and their worth and consider and see other people's needs, not just your own needs. We hear that all the time, don't we? It's not just about you. It's not just about you. And in the church it certainly is not just about ourselves. So Paul says these things, he says you know about these things, and you can implement these things and continue to do these things until Jesus appears. He continues now in verse five, he says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So here Paul leaves off the things he knows that they have. They have faith, they have love, they have unity, humility, they have compassion. And he calls them to go beyond these things to imitate Christ himself. Wow, to go beyond these things? You mean there's more? And he says, yes, there's more. Go beyond these things to the end state of Christian maturity. Well, what does that require? What does this imitation of Christ demand of us? Well, in a word, the emptying of self. Now for Jesus, the emptying of self required that he submit to God's plan to save man from condemnation due to sin, resulting in spiritual death. This idea Paul explains in several stages. First of all, he says Jesus is God, has always been God, and because of this did not either aspire to be divine, you know, grasp, he already was God. He didn't grasp after being divine, he already was God. Nor did he refuse to alter his divine nature in some way in order to save mankind. Secondly, he says Jesus altered his divine nature by taking on a human nature incorporated into his divine nature. In other words, he gave up nothing of his godly nature in doing this. He merely altered his nature to include and thus permit his interactions with human beings as a human being himself, thus becoming fully human while remaining fully divine. He then, he, Paul says, he then emptied his human nature of any glorious appearances and effects that his divine nature would impart on him as a man. Now think of what the, uh, think of what Jesus appeared like on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? His glorified body was shining brightly, but this state was revealed only to his closest three apostles, Matthew, uh, seven, uh, Matthew 17 rather, two to four, right? Only a few apostles saw that glorified state of his body. Jesus instead was born to poor people and he experienced normal human life and suffering and temptations. Hebrews 4 verse 15. And in addition to taking on a human nature in order to complete his divinely appointed mission, he allowed himself to be unjustly executed as a common slave, because only slaves were subject to execution by crucifixion, according to Roman law. Now you know, some people think you know, when they read that he emptied himself. They think that he emptied himself means that he emptied himself of part or all of his divine nature and he replaced it with a human nature. But this is incorrect and it's incorrect for several reasons. First of all, God cannot become less than God or else he would not be God. 
And secondly, if Jesus exchanged his divine nature for a human one, then he would only be human while on earth, and this is not what the Bible teaches. You know, in John chapter one, the Gospel of John 118, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And then a little further down, and the Word became flesh. And in Colossians 1, 15 to 20, where Paul talks about Jesus, the exact, you know, the exact image of God. So here both John and Paul explain in detail the dual natures of Jesus. He was God and He was man simultaneously. In context here in Philippians, Paul is not asking the Philippians to somehow submit to a cruel and unjust death in order to imitate Christ. In other words, you all got to be martyrs if you're going to imitate Christ, although many have had to do that throughout the years. The broader lesson for all Christians who seek Christian maturity is that our imitation of Christ really begins when we start the process of emptying ourselves of self. As God, Jesus had no need and no possibility of becoming less divine. However, he did have options as far as the human nature he incorporated into his divine nature. For example, was he to come as a king or as a common man when he became a human? Was he to be rich or poor, respected or rejected? Was he to gain victory through power or victory through weakness? Was he to refuse the cup of suffering or drink the cup of suffering? Was it to be his will or the Father's will? So as Paul writes, Jesus emptied himself to the point of dying a cruel death like a common criminal. His emptying of self was dictated by the will of the Father in completing the plan for man's salvation. Let's just jump out of Philippians and go to John for a moment. John 6, 38, he says, for, Jesus says, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. In the same way, the emptying of self in our lives resulting in Christian maturity as we imitate Christ requires us to constantly seek and obey God's will instead of our own will for our lives. So if someone's saying, well, how do I empty myself of self? You obey God's will. Jesus emptied his human self of self. How? By obeying God's will. To be born poor, to, be, you know, to suffer, to, to die on the cross. Now this does not necessarily mean we will, we will be poor or unjustly accused or executed for our faith. It might, but not necessarily so. It does mean, however, that we will suffer the emotional as well as physical pain that comes as a result of denying our own will and desires and flesh in order to do the will and purpose of Christ in our lives. Paul does not give specific examples of this emptying of ourselves, but he provides the glorious result of this as it took place in the life of Jesus. Verse nine to 11, he says, for this reason also, God highly exalted him. For what reason? Well, that he emptied himself. That's the reason. So for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So Jesus emptied his human nature, he emptied his human nature of any glory that it might have exhibited because it was embedded in his divine nature. But now that his mission was completed, God raised him from the dead, not as his emptied self, but as his glorious self. We see this as the gospel writers described his appearances after his resurrection in the glorious and exalted form that Paul speaks of here. In addition to his glorious appearance, Jesus' resurrection also confirms that he now is exalted above every other human prophet, leader, and savior who ever lived or who will ever live. Peter states this in Acts, 
4.12, he says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. So Jesus was rejected, put on a cross, but now the way of salvation can only be accessed through Him, His name. So Paul declares that this is so now and will be so until the judgment and beyond. Jesus, the God-man, is Lord above all. Now it's not said, it's merely implied here, that the emptying of ourselves in order to be filled with Christ will also, after our own resurrection, yield similar glorious and eternal results. And if you want to read about that, read 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 58. So let's summarize, he says in verses 12 and 13, so then my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. So Paul adds a word of encouragement to all those who would seek maturity by initiating this emptying of self, primarily achieved by the effort to obey God's will. He's happy to note that they have done this in the past when he was with them and have continued to do so despite his absence. Don't forget, four years. He hasn't seen these people, well, for longer than that, but he's been confined for four years. Working out their salvation in fear and trembling. Whoa, who, who are we supposed to be afraid of? You know, this, is not a, this is not like he's not you know, preaching hell, fire, and damnation to them. No, this is an encouragement to keep the faith and maintain their walk with God, recognizing that Satan, through his lies and the, the draw of the world, these are constant threats to their soul. Fear and tremble because the danger is real and they need to be careful. The good news, however, is that God Himself, through the Holy Spirit and His Word and His Church, are partners with Christians uh, who seek to know and imitate Christ. And when all of these agree on what they desire, there's great joy and confidence for success. I can therefore be confident that what I desire to empty myself of self and fill myself with Christ, I'm confident that this is according to God's will and He through the Spirit and Word and Church will joyfully accomplish. This is a, this is a prayer that God answers. Dear Lord, please help me to do what you want me to do. Very simple, but very profound. So Paul describes an important indicator of the maturing Christian, the desire to imitate Jesus. This, he says, is accomplished as the believer empties himself of self, much as Jesus emptied his human nature of all reflective divine glory, and filled the void with God's will in the mission of saving mankind. This not only led to the salvation of mankind, but the glorifying of Jesus Christ as the Lord of Lords forever. In the same way, God works at filling us up with the things of Christ so that we too will be raised up with glorified bodies to live with Christ forever and ever one day. All right, nobody can say that there's not much to say and talk about in the book of Philippians, but we'll just stop right there and we'll continue on next time. Thank you for your attention.